After January 1959, visitors to Albany's ramshackle old executive mansion, home to governors of New York, beginning with Samuel J. Tilden, were unprepared for the total makeover of the place Theodore Roosevelt's children had compared uh, not altogether favorably to a railroad terminal. <laughs> Walls only recently denuded of Averill Harriman's Gilbert Stewart portraits now groaned under the new governors Pollock's and Picasso's, Motherwell's, and Mondrian's, part of the justifiably famed collection assembled by Nelson Rockefeller. Um, art meant more to Nelson Rockefeller, arguably, than politics. We'll get into that later, and it's one of the surprising things that I kept learning that prolonged this 14-year process of discovery. If you went to the governor's 34-room uh, triplex apartment on Fifth Avenue, for example, you would find the fireplace painted by Henri Matisse. The Giacometti brothers did the andirons. Mark Hatfield, his fellow moderate liberal governor from Oregon, told me the story of being given a tour of the apartment and of course being blown away by all this extraordinary world-class art. And at the end of it he said, Nelson, I have to ask you, of all your collections, which one gives you the most pleasure? And he said, oh, Mark, that's easy, it's my china. He said, sometimes I get up in the middle of the night just to set the table. <laughs> Hanging in the front hall of the executive mansion, where its formless splotches of color mystified many a caller, Richard Lytle's composition was said to be Nelson's favorite canvas. It's a completely abstract painting the governor's first wife, Todd, explained to the uninitiated, it means something different to each person. The same might be said of its owner. And that's, in a nutshell, why it's taken me 14 years to know him, even imperfectly. As Richard said, at one's best, you can go through all the papers and you can talk to people Nelson Rockefeller was a particularly elusive subject. His daughter Mary was once quoted as saying, we, referring to her and her siblings, we only wish we knew him as well as the voters of New York. But of course, the voters of New York only knew what he wanted them to know. Um, he was very much his mother's son, but he inherited some of his father's reticence as well. A junior, as he was known until the day he died, John D. Rockefeller Jr., advised his children never show more surface than necessary. That runs counter to the uh, backslapping, blinseeding, tax raising force of nature that we still remember. Um, but it turns out to be an important component of who he was. Early in the process, someone close to him, told me, you'll find he's a 16 slice pizza pie, and no one but happy his second wife had access to more than two or three slices of the pie. Um, I have since discovered, if anything, he um, undercounted the slices. We are the greatest state in the greatest nation in the most exciting period in the history of the world, declared New York's new governor uh, near the end of his first year in office. And we find ourselves bogged down with frustrations and harassed by problems and uncertainties when we should be concentrating our attention with enthusiasm and excitement on shaping the forces of the future. That's Nelson Rockefeller, as we remember him, the man who genuinely believed there was no such thing as a problem that could not be solved, who said, who defined the role of government as converting problems into opportunities. You don't hear a lot of that from politicians today, but that's an important part of his identity. 14 years learning and equally important 14 years unlearning things that I thought I had known about this remarkable man. Nelson Aldrich Rockefeller was more Aldrich than Rockefeller. 
What does that mean? Um, his grandfather, Nelson Aldrich, was Republican leader of the United States Senate, senator from Rhode Island, and it was his daughter, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, a remarkable woman, um, someone who I've said combined the, the finer qualities of Margaret Sanger, Mabel Dodge, and Auntie Mame, um, the woman who really founded the Museum of Modern Art, the woman who passed on to her son, by all accounts, her favorite child, um, her joy de vivre, her excitement about everything, her openness to new ideas, her curiosity about new people, uh, and certainly different forms of artistic expression. It was said that when Nelson was born, Abby told the family, all right, I've done my duty by this family. I've given you a John the Third. This one is mine. Uh, and whether she said it or not, uh, she certainly acted it. Um, but he was his father's son as well. I've never known anyone as complicated as Nelson Rockefeller. I've certainly never written about anyone as complicated. And yet, so many of us still see him in monolithic terms. He looked like a monolith. You know, he looked as if he'd been carved from granite. Over and over again, I've run into people who said, you know, when I met him, he was shorter than I expected. His father, well, the work ethic. Delson Rockefeller is a workaholic. Someone said to him once, you know, you could have been governor, you could have been gigolo. And he said, oh, God, I would have died of boredom. I think that's true. He was a workaholic. Harry Albright, uh, a name who I'm no doubt people in Albany still remember, told me the story when he first joined the staff. The governor, of course, was in New York more than he was in Albany. And he ran the state, really, from the two twin houses, uh, townhouses on 55th Street, uh, connected to the twin townhouses on 54th Street. Anyway, Harry saw the big New York One Chrysler limousine outside 20 West 55th, and he noticed early in the day, the governor was in the back seat, obviously working away. And he knows this happened several mornings. And finally, he sort of screwed up his courage and asked him why. And he said, oh, my father always told me, you have to finish your last day's work before you can start the next day. And so there he was, 8, 8.30 in the morning, toiling away, a dyslexic who prided himself on being able to return with comments every memo within 24 hours. He was not a politician who collected art. He was a frustrated artist who went into politics in no small measure because it gratified his need to be creative and to control. And the best example of that is the South Mall. Um, a little bit of both, actually a lot of both, if you stop to think about it. But there was Battery Park City, and there was Roosevelt Island. Uh, there were 55 state parks created during the Rockefeller years. And it wasn't just bricks and mortar. In politics, as in his vast art collection, Rockefeller prided himself on being ahead of the curve. It's very interesting. You know, he'd worked for three presidents before he became governor, two Democrats, one Republican. The two Democrats, by the way, both told him that he could be president if he changed his party. Um, and the one Republican probably wished that he had. <clears throat> but he learned. He observed. Um, he went to Washington at the age of 32 as Franklin Roosevelt's Latin American coordinator. And at first, with a businessman's mind, he thought Roosevelt's methods of government were at best disorderly. But he very quickly learned how FDR functioned and the superiority of his somewhat unorthodox methods. He never got over Franklin Roosevelt. On his desk in 54th Street, there were two pictures. One was of his son Michael, whom he lost tragically in 1961 on an art collecting expedition to New Guinea. And next to it was a picture of Franklin D. Roosevelt inscribed to my old friend, Nelson Rockefeller. Like Roosevelt, he was synonymous. You know, there was a whole generation of people for whom 
FDR was not only the president, but the presidency. Nelson Rockefeller occupied a similar role here in New York. But he thought that government should be more than simply reactive. At its best, it should be proactive. In his first year as governor, for example, he chose 40 task forces, not to evade problems, as is customary today, but to anticipate and attack them. So there were task forces on everything from how to increase milk consumption uh, in this dairy state to what the state's electricity needs would be through the, 20th, uh, through the end of the 20th century, um, on and on and on. Eventually, of course, events overwhelmed him as they would anyone, but it is revealing that that was the approach he took initially. Of course, it was said here in Albany that he owned one political party and rented the other. Um, I can assure you the lease was not exorbitant. Um, he did better when Democrats controlled the legislature, frankly, than Republicans. Uh, but he was ahead of the curve. New York, under Rockefeller, continued its pioneering tradition uh, in the vanguard of civil rights, mass transit, urban housing, labor law, mental health, aid to private education, consumer protection. This was an era when George Wallace was standing in the courthouse door and calling it states' rights. And Nelson Rockefeller had a very different uh, definition of, of that phrase. He said that the preservation of states' rights uh, depended on the exercise of states' responsibilities. So in 1965, New York State spent more money to combat water pollution than the federal government did in all 50 states. On his watch, mandatory seatbelt laws were enacted, along with the first state minimum wage in America. No-fault auto insurance, a radical overhaul of the state's antiquated divorce laws. He signed bills to legalize abortion and end the death penalty. And of course, he transformed a handful of underfunded community colleges and normal schools into the world's largest university system. John Kennedy might be lionized for the glittering artists who filled his White House, but it was Nelson Rockefeller who established the first state arts council in America. And characteristically, when the state had its first fiscal crisis in the early 70s, the very first thing that all the politicians wanted to cut was the arts council. And that was the one thing that Nelson Rockefeller absolutely refused to cut. In fact, I think they actually increased spending one year. He wasn't simply a collector of art. He was an instructor of art. The mall is an outdoor art gallery. Those buildings are abstract expressionist works in and of themselves, whatever you think of them. Um, they're an advertisement for the New York art world post-1945. Nelson believed the culture was not something at the bottom of the list of priorities. He thought the Arts Council and what it represented, what it inspired, um, was at the very center of our, our identity. If you talk about New York identity, I guarantee you, he would say that's where you will find New York's identity in its artists, in the culture that they represent. All of this, of course, was consistent with his activist temperament uh, and his lifelong distrust of ideological cul-de-sacs. More than once, he said he had a Republican head and a Democratic heart. That's probably why, that's one reason he never became president. Because even then, in a real sense, he was a man without a party. He was offering people what we today call a third way. And in that, as in so much else, arguably, he was ahead of his time. The divorce and remarriage may have sold a lot of newspapers, but it did not cost Nelson Rockefeller the White House. It is interesting, writing a book in 2014, 
trying to make people understand why a divorce and remarriage were deemed fatal just 50 years ago. Um, John F. Kennedy couldn't believe that Rockefeller, in fact, would get divorced. He said to uh, Kay Graham, no man would ever love love more than politics, which tells you a little bit more about JFK <laughs> than it does about Nelson Rockefeller. The fact of the matter is, before 1963, certainly by 1960, the Republican Party was already mutating. At the end of the Eisenhower years, it was already evolving into the Goldwater Party. Two weeks before that year's election between Nixon and Kennedy, Goldwater called Thruston Morton, the Republican national chairman, and he had some advice. He said that Nixon basically shouldn't waste the last 10 days of the campaign in the urban Northeast, i.e. going after minorities or ethnic voters. Instead, he should stick to Illinois and Texas. And then being Goldwater, of course, he couldn't stop there. He said, I'd like to win this goddamn election without New York. He said, then we could tell New York to kiss our ass and we could start a really conservative party. And that's exactly what happened. But it was not only Nelson Rockefeller's timing um, that was a factor, perhaps, in the frustration of his presidential hopes. It was also his temperament. He went through life believing that the best way to win the presidency was to demonstrate a genius for governing. Well, that worked in New York. But he was in a party that was increasingly suspicious of government itself. Al Marshall, uh, redoubtable Al Marshall, uh, one of his uh, secretaries, in effect deputy governors, said to me, he was always in the wrong pew. No, he said, hell, he was always in the wrong church. <laughs> so it was, he was asked, well, why didn't you change your party registration? Perfectly reasonable question. Nelson Rockefeller knew himself. He said, if I was a Democrat, I would be in a position of always trying to hold people back. But as a Republican, I'm always trying to push them forward. Another fundamental error, I don't think he ever fully appreciated the difference between a November campaign, which in those days, and particularly New York, meant attracting Democrats and independents, which he demonstrably was able to do. The difference between a November campaign and what it took to get nominated especially in the Republican Party. After Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in 1968, Nelson moved to fill the void remarkably well. His crowds expanded. Um, large numbers of African Americans and Hispanics uh, turned out to cheer him on. A, a whole host of Kennedy supporters rallied, all of which got him exactly zero Republican delegates. And yet, civil rights mattered a lot. It wasn't just a family tradition. And people knew it mattered a lot. I remember talking to Stu Spencer, who ran the California campaign in 1964 against Goldwater, and later, of course, became associated with Ronald Reagan. A remarkable thing happened in California. Today, we look back at California, and we see you how know, it was narrowly lost, and we theorize as to why. But I discovered, after talking to Stu, how close Rockefeller came. And the reason he came that close was because 55,000 African American voters in Los Angeles County alone changed their registration from Democrat to Republican so they could vote for Nelson Rockefeller in what was undoubtedly the only Republican primary in which they would ever participate. Um, they understood that this was a man who cared about them, um, whose family, of course, had a long-standing tradition of support for civil rights. The relationship with Martin Luther King 
was closer than I think has ever been documented before. In 1958, when Dr. King was stabbed in Harlem, Nelson picked up his hospital bills quietly. In 1963, when the civil rights movement reached in many ways its moral apogee in Birmingham, or Bombingham, as it was known, the most segregated city in America, Dr. King was running out of money, running out of troops to be arrested and bailed out, challenging the white segregationist power structure of the city. Nelson was off on his honeymoon, but he hadn't forgotten the civil rights battle going on back home. So Clarence Jones, Dr. King's personal lawyer, found himself summoned one day to the vault of the Chase Manhattan Bank. It doesn't get much more establishment than that. And he was presented a suitcase full of money and a note for a loan. And of course, as soon as he got back to Birmingham, he found another note saying the loan had been forgiven. And the $100,000 in that suitcase went a long way toward victory in Birmingham with all that that meant uh, for civil rights in America. The saddest thing in my book, I think, is a statement attributed to a member of his family who heard Nelson a month before he died describe himself as a failure because he never became president which, if nothing else, suggests the scale of aspiration in that family. For once, I think his powers of self-knowledge failed him. Um, if he had never become governor, he would still be a major figure in 20th century America. I'll give you one example. In 19, we, we all know that it was not only the Rockefellers, it was really Nelson. It was his father's money and Nelson's drive at the very last minute that persuaded the United Nations, that was going to Philadelphia, believe it or not, um, to wind up on the Upper East Side. Now, no doubt, generations of New York motorists have uh, cursed him ever since. <laughs> but that's neither here nor there. Um, but it's what he did at the organizing conference of the United Nations that makes him a permanently significant figure in the history of the century. Together with his Latin allies, he introduced and in effect rewrote the UN Charter to include something called Article 51, which allowed for the establishment of regional defensive alliances. That led in turn to NATO. And the history of the Cold War would be very different indeed uh, had NATO not existed. Harry Truman fired him and brought him back four years later to run Point Four, which was a foreign aid program of sorts. He was well qualified because, again, one of the little known aspects of Nelson Rockefeller's life, and one that gives a kind of unity to what he himself may have thought of as a scattershot pattern, he's beginning in 1937, 29 years old. He goes to Venezuela to look at the operations of his grandfather's oil company and is appalled by what he sees. Standard Oil literally was surrounding itself with barbed wire. The people who worked there had no contact with those whom they referred to as the natives. None of them spoke the language. Nelson upbraided a woman at a cocktail party for this fact, and she replied in all good faith, well, why would I learn the language? Who would I have to talk to? He went back to New York, determined to change all that. And as it happened, he, shortly after that, he addressed the annual meeting of Standard Oil, and he announced that from now on, if you wanted to work in my grandfather's company uh, overseas, you were going to learn the language, um, you were going to interact with the natives, et cetera, et cetera. There was more and more of this. Um, and as he sat down, the chairman of the meeting leaned over and whispered in his ear, I didn't know we had a communist in our midst. <laughs> 
But the fact is, that was only the beginning of his lifelong pursuit of what he called a better capitalism. The idea, he could see into the future. He, even at the height of World War II, with the US-Soviet alliance being what it was, he envisioned a Cold War coming, a war of ideas. And capitalism had to get out of its rut, had to tear down the barbed wire, had to reach out to people throughout what today we call the third world, training them, employing them, demonstrating to them the tangible, practical benefits of democratic capitalism. That's what led him after the war to create a hybrid company. He said there was a Sunday company and a company for the rest of the week. Part of the company existed to make profits through farming and dairy products and food processing and fishing. But the profits didn't go back in the form of dividends to stockholders. The profits were instead plowed into the other company, which existed to educate, train, provide technical expertise, improve education, uh, create a, a South American version of the 4-H clubs, on and on and on. And this is something that really throughout his life, in the 1960s, Richard Nixon sent him to Latin America on a series of very stormy tours, which demonstrated just how, how great the gap between American democracy at that point um, and, and, and a feeling of neglect and even need exploitation on the part of many in South America. He was a different kind of Republican, there's no doubt about it, but he was a different kind of politician. I feel that if you don't have good health or a good education, then society has let you down, he said. Imagine hearing that today, the idea that there's such a thing as society that we have, in addition to individual identities, a collective identity. Yes, a collective conscience. And that it is all the more important for the wealthy nations of the world, just as it is for the wealthy individuals in those nations, to assume a responsibility, not noblesse oblige, but the moral obligation that each brother owns, owes to his brother, Winthrop Rockefeller, when Dr. King was murdered in 1968, famously stood on the steps of the Arkansas State House and paid tribute, saying, we shall overcome, and said that he was not his brother's keeper, he was his brother's brother. That sentiment, I think, runs throughout the Rockefeller family. It's what led the late great Jack Jamon, who covered him here in Albany and in Washington, to say to me, Nelson wasn't a liberal, he was a Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> but the tradition goes further than that. Nelson Rockefeller might be written off by many today as a relic, a, a, a museum object himself. But people who do that, it seems to me, are unaware of a much longer political tradition. It goes back, in this country, at least to Theodore Roosevelt. By the way, when Nelson was about six years old, TR, the scourge of Standard Oil, came to visit his family. And Nelson being Nelson, he climbed up in TR's lap and demanded to know how the um, safari hunter got his giraffes through the Hudson Tunnel. <laughs> he kept asking hard questions all his life. And TR, who was absolutely charmed by this little version of himself, uh, explained with great gravity that there was a detailed system of pulleys and levers that one employed, and <laughs> that's, how it, that's how it happened. But stop and think for just a minute. Theodore Roosevelt is in many ways the most thoughtful of conservatives. He came out of Manhattan's brownst uh, brownstones at the age of 22 to the horror of his uh, patrician um, neighbors and friends. 
decided he wanted, as he said, to be part of the governing class. That meant coming to Albany as a member of the assembly. He came to understand early in his career as someone who had profoundly benefited from the capitalist system that although it was clearly better than any alternative, it wasn't perfect because it was run by human beings. And there were inevitably injustices and inequities and bumps in the road. And it was the conservatives' obligation as the ultimate defender of that system to look into the future, anticipate those problems, and to campaign for reform so as to prevent the possibility of revolution. And so he worked to improve working conditions and fought the trusts. And of course, then as governor, uh, tried to improve the Stygian conditions in the tenements of New York. Um, and gradually over time, he grew into what you and I would think of as a great social reformer. The pattern goes back further. It's Disraeli and his property-owning democracy in Great Britain. And the pattern goes future uh, to Franklin Roosevelt, uh, the man who saved democratic capitalism from itself, only to be dismissed by Hearst and his uh, right-wing allies as Stalin Delano Roosevelt. The interesting thing is, he was a polarizing figure. He was a controversial figure. But he banked at the very beginning of his presidency, literally in the first speech of his presidency, an emotional bond with the American people. He banked credit from that defining moment that would serve him all the way through his governor or through his presidency. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller wasn't quite so fortunate, but guess what? People had four opportunities to pass judgment on him, and they reelected him three times. The campaign of 1966 is maybe the most important campaign he ever waged because it's the least like the campaign we've just been through. In 1966, as was often the case, he started out 30 points behind. He was always 30 points behind at the beginning because he was running against himself. And all people could think of was his taxes, of which there were many. Um, there were lots of people who urged him not to run. Quite frankly, there were some who thought, after the divorce and remarriage, why subject happy to the possible ordeal of an electoral defeat that might, in fact, unfairly be blamed on the divorce and remarriage. Um, but by that time, of course, he had a legacy. He said, I know if they beat me, what they're coming after. The first thing they'll come after is Sunni, and the second thing is the mall. So of course he sped up work on both, along with election year ribbon cuttings. The people of New York, you didn't know it, but you selected all the art that you'll see in the South Mall um, for actually less than $3 million. It was, a, it was a, a bargain, whatever else you may say about it. But he set out to do something that I don't think any politician in either party would dare do today. And that is, he went from town to town defending the taxes and explaining what they bought. The campaign commercials, go on YouTube, they, they remain the best, the most entertaining, and the most persuasive ever created. There was the talking fish that talked about how much life in the neighborhood had improved since the governor's anti-pollution efforts had kicked in. <laughs> there, was, there was a wonderful cartoon that showed an overhead aerial view of highway moving beneath you at whatever, 60 miles an hour. And in the background, the unmistakable tinny sounds of Hawaiian luau music. And at the end of the 60 seconds, the voiceover said, Governor Rockefeller has built enough roads to reach Honolulu and back. 
What more did you need to know? In other words, it was a campaign that said, this is what I've done with your taxes. And then he went around and said, and, and if we, fine, repeal the tax, and then who's going to decide which school program gets cut? Because you know what? 61% of New York's revenue collected by the state goes back to cities and towns. Anyway, it was an extraordinary substantive come from behind campaign. And I think it ranks with Harry Truman's 1948 um, campaign at, at the least. The drug laws. There are some people who remember him for two things, Attica and the drug laws. And they insist he moved right in the later years. The drug laws, first of all, there had been two previous drug programs, both of them largely therapeutic. Remember, this is a man, for better or worse, who believed every problem could be solved. When he failed the first two times, you knew there was going to be a third try. Uh, it just turned into a radically different direction. He, he told a friend at one point, you know, I've wasted a billion dollars fighting drugs. Most of us would have said, okay, maybe we'll call it a day. That was not Nelson Rockefeller's style. I remember Lawrence Rockefeller telling me that had his brother served a fifth term, there would have been a fourth drug program when he realized that the third drug program wasn't fulfilling its promise. Attica. We could obviously spend all night. What I tried to do in this book, and it's the hardest chapter to write, because it's such an incredibly complex story, and because everyone had, in their own eyes, justification for what they did. No one can justify the conditions in Attica Correctional Facility. Ironically, Rockefeller had named Russell Oswald as a reforming corrections commissioner. Unfortunately, it coincided with the first state budget crisis, and corrections were not spared. But beyond that, the second part of the story, the takeover and his immediate response, chance. He wasn't in New York when it happened. He was in Washington, D.C. And by the time he, in effect, got a handle on the situation, Russell Oswald had decided that he could negotiate a peaceful end to the, uh, to the crisis. In retrospect, Rockefeller believed the mistake was in not continuing on with the initial retaking of the prison, which in fact had taken back much of it. You can argue both ways his decision not to go to Attica. The problem for his historical reputation is that that decision became conflated with the terribly botched retaking of the prison the next day and all of the horrors, and the mishandling, and the misinformation. And so in <laughs> what happened was the, quote, outside observers, who were anything but observers, and the television cameras that followed in their wake, were unable, following tragically uh, the death of a corrections officer, to keep the issues focused on the 28 points of specific institutional reform, most, all of them suggested by inmates, all of them acceptable to the state. But suddenly, the 28 points, in effect, were old news. The issue became amnesty. Rockefeller could not have granted it legally had he been so inclined, and he was not so inclined. It is an extraordinarily complex story. Um, 
And 40 years later, there's no doubt that for many people, his name will always be besmirched by Attica. Had he gone, as he was urged to do by a number of people, if anything else, if for, for nothing other than PR purposes, he would have demonstrated his concern, his hands-on involvement. And this is the thing that people find perplexing. I talked with a number of his associates who are still scratching their heads in wonder. They don't understand how this man, who was so quick to put himself in the middle of any situation, who believed, as I've said repeatedly, that anything could be fixed, anything could be solved, why he was so loath to go to the prison. And there are a number of reasons that he spoke of, publicly and privately. Uh, he believed very sincerely that if he went, uh, the prisoners would want him to come into the yard. And if that didn't satisfy them, they'd want the president of the United States. And again, it's hard 40 years later to understand how overheated the atmosphere was on all sides. So everyone's imagining of the worst, although it may sound paranoid and fantastic today, was not that then. But I found at the end of 14 years, going through, I copied 60,000 pages of primary source material, did 150 interviews of my own, looking for the quote that would explain not only his refusal to go to Attica, but this strange on again, off again attitude about the presidency. Most people think he pursued it all his life with single-minded intensity. The absolute opposite is, is the case. Richard Nixon pursued it all his life <laughs> with absolute intensity. Why did he almost run in 1960 and then surprise everyone the day after Christmas announcing that he wouldn't? Why did he astonish everyone, including members of his own family, in March of 1968? only to get back in the race a month later, but by then the damage was done. And of course, why did he not go to Attica? Well, here's a quote that may help to explain. It's true that Nelson Rockefeller, following his father's advice, rarely, if ever, showed more surface than necessary. But in this quote, it seems to me he came as close as he ever did, if unintentionally, to explaining the otherwise unexplainable. When I became insecure because of events getting out of control and beyond my capacity, I always pulled back to a base which was controllable. Well, in the case of Attica, that was his grandfather's study at Kaikit, the house at Procatico Hills. In the Republican Party, that was New York State. It ended depressingly in the vice presidency. Uh, he had been offered the job by Richard Nixon in 1960. Hubert Humphrey offered him the job in 1968 asking him to be part of a national unity government. Uh, he turned them both down. I don't think he could conceive of leaving his father's political party, and he certainly couldn't conceive of himself serving in what he always described as standby equipment. So why say yes when Gerald Ford asked him in 1974? Well, I think there are two reasons. One, very genuinely, it was an, the nation was in crisis. And even though he said he'd known every vice president since Henry Wallace, and they were all miserable, <laughs> he was willing to take the chance. But that wasn't the whole reason. Several people who knew him tried to talk him out of it. They knew how miserable, compounded he would be. He, first of all, had been governor of New York State for 15 years. 
at a time when to be governor of New York State was automatically to be assumed a president in waiting. But more than that, he was a Rockefeller. And more than that, he was Nelson Rockefeller. So he had every reason not to take this job. And he listened to someone for 20 minutes, outline all the reasons why he shouldn't do it. And then he said, look, everything you said makes sense. But you're overlooking one thing. This is as close as I'm ever going to get. And in fact, the closest he ever came to being president was the day Squeaky Fromm took a pot shot at President Ford um, when he was told the news they explained that she was part of the Manson gang, and he said, what's a Manson gang? <laughs> what I would like to do to wrap this up is to do something I have not done anywhere on this book tour, um, and that is to read briefly, maybe 10, 15 minutes from the book a slice of the book of particular interest, hopefully, to the people of Albany about the origins, the true origins, of the South Mall. Given his passion for building, it was only a question of time before Rockefeller turned his sights on New York's capital, whose proud past served only to accentuate its current decay suffering the same exodus of people and businesses that afflicted much of urban America at the threshold of the 1960s, Albany was unmistakably a city in decline. Said one close Rockefeller associate, it makes Tobacco Road look like Park Avenue south of 72nd Street. <laughs> the September 1959 visit of Princess Beatrix of the Netherlands presented the governor with a severe logistical challenge. Having Her Highness arrive by boat limited her exposure to the blighted environs around the executive mansion. A year later, the King and Queen of Denmark flew into town, and short of blindfolding the eminent visitors, <laughs> there was no way to hide the shabby face of the old Dutch trading post. Both visits would later be cited as catalysts for Rockefeller's defining building project. In truth, a more prosaic reality governed his actions. Quote, we needed space for state office buildings, says Bill Ronan. Beyond this stark fact, quote, Nelson was very interested in doing something downtown because downtown was dying. Rockefeller hadn't forgotten some advice delivered at the start of his governorship by Tom Dewey's protege, Burdell Bixby, quote, Start building a monument to yourself, Bixby counseled him. Confirming evidence of this came in 1964, when the former governor's name was formally affixed to the 562-mile New York State Thruway constructed on his watch. Within weeks of taking office, Rockefeller had ordered the grimy old Capitol scrubbed and its western facade floodlit at night. Neglected lawns were replanted, dotted with beds of roses, the state flower. A fountain appeared in a park, hitherto given up to derelicts. Inside the massive structure, Rockefeller streamlined the executive workspace. He transformed a dusty Civil War museum through the addition of modern lighting, exhibits, and professionally trained guides. All this was merely prelude to the main event. <coughs> From the governor's second floor office, the view south toward the executive mansion encompassed some 40 blocks whose 6,000 inhabitants had proven themselves reliable supporters of Dan O'Connell and his democratic machine, on occasion reporting more votes than census counted voters. <laughs> the area went by multiple names. To historic preservationists, whether of buildings or political majorities, it was the Pastures, a deep-rooted, lower-middle-class neighborhood of Italian row houses and Jewish-owned shops, descended from a 17th-century common grazing space. <coughs> Excuse me, to Rockefeller, it was the gut, a sinner's paradise notable for the 1931 murder of gangster Legs Diamond and for more recent commercial establishments with names 
like French Emma's, Big Charlie's, and the Red Onion. In the years prior to World War I, the area had supported an estimated 1,200 prostitutes, from dollar trick streetwalkers to bunny-hugging hostesses whose refinements earned them $25 an evening. For a brief time in the 1940s, Tom Dewey had menaced the O'Connell machine by launching a series of highly publicized investigations into municipal and county government. The former gangbuster called off the dogs only after O'Connell threatened to identify prominent Republican patrons of some of the guts' seamier establishments. <laughs> by the time Rockefeller took up residence, the neighborhood featured as many vacant lots as rooming houses. Rockefeller considered this an affront to every New Yorker. There is nothing in the laws of nature or the nature of men, he declared, to require that a state which is big and vital and productive must also be mundane, dirty, and ugly. In April 1961, he established his Blue Ribbon Temporary State Commission on the capital city in defiance of Mayor Erastus Corning. First elected in 1943, the product of a dynasty grounded in Martin Van Buren's Albany Regency, Corning had no intention of surrendering control of his city to some Republican outsider intent on using it as a springboard to the White House, especially this outsider. The two men had a history. In the 1920s, the Cornings, enriched by their stake in the Albany Iron Works and a healthy share of government contracts, during World War I, had established a summer residence on Maine's Mount Desert Island. Young Erastus and Nelson Rockefeller, his senior by 15 months, had competed against each other on the tennis courts of the Northeast Harbor Club and in the tricky waters off Mount Desert. Now the boyhood antagonists battled for supremacy before a national audience. Whether they had in fact grown up at all was open to dispute. <laughs> Never more so than when Nelson ordered sycamore trees planted within sight of Corning City Hall, confident it would offend the mayor's aesthetic sensibilities. Nor was it accidental that Rockefeller's intervention on behalf of a more beautiful Albany should occur six months after the mayor took the wraps off his own downtown improvement effort. Corning accused Rockefeller of trampling on home rule. But these were mere skirmishes compared with the mortal combat joined early in 1962. By then, the Wilson Commission, uh, named for Lieutenant Governor Malcolm Wilson, entrusted with site selection for a state government complex, had considered five different locations, most too remote from downtown to boost the local economy. That Rockefeller had his own ideas on the subject was confirmed one Saturday afternoon when he appeared with Wally Harrison in the office of counsel Bob McCrate. Bob, said Rockefeller, do you mind if Wally and I sit on the table behind your desk? It's the only place on the second floor of the Capitol where we can look all the way over to Lincoln Park. For the next two hours, as McCrate organized the coming week's business, his visitors mapped out the future South Mall. Nelson always spelled it the South M-A-U-L. Mm. They took pains to conceal their intentions from their counterparts across State Street in Albany City Hall. For the state to surrender the element of surprise was to invite an orgy of land speculation and semi-official extortion. On a Sunday evening in January 1962, Rockefeller assembled key staff members in the executive mansion. Budget Director Norm Hurd presented a list of projects and programs where overspending had occurred, all relevant to the state's deficiency budget. Does anybody have any other things to add or discuss? Rockefeller asked those in attendance. Ronan took his cue. Why don't we put in $33 million to take the property downtown? Great idea, said Rockefeller. <laughs> Governor Heard interjected, this is a deficiency appropriation. Well, this is a deficiency. <laughs> we want the land and this, figuratively calling their attention to the seedy landscape surrounding the mansion, this is a deficiency. 
Ronan supplied the legislative rationale, declaring, if you put this up as an individual item, you'll never pass it. If you put it up right, right up front, you'll know whether you can go with it or not. Rockefeller was well pleased. In the event, lawmakers swallowed hard and approved the full sum. In March 1962, surveyors appeared on downtown street corners, instruments of their trade in hand, trying to look inconspicuous. <laughs> Should questions be raised by citizens or probing journalists, the surveyors were to identify themselves as students, some admittedly a bit long in the tooth, <laughs> from nearby Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, <laughs> engaged in a class project. On March 27th, the Rockefeller aide strode into the county clerk's office, clutching a newly drawn map of downtown Albany. Malcolm Wilson, who maintained close ties to the state's Catholic hierarchy, had managed to save the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception from the wrecking ball. Not so with 1,150 other structures on 98.5 acres, among them four churches, 29 saloons, a new high school, and a police station. Once the transfer was officialized, Bill Ronan notified Rockefeller that he was now landlord of seven whorehouses. <laughs> you don't say, he replied. <laughs> Erastus Corning wasted no time in denouncing the process from which he had been deliberately excluded, decrying the, quote, sterile monument Rockefeller would impose on the rubble of a vibrant urban neighborhood, Corning filed suit to block the state's, quote, ruthless takeover. The lawsuit achieved its immediate objective by demonstrating to constituents that Corning had no intention of rolling over for the Republican governor and his bulldozers. His outrage eased perceptibly once Rockefeller offered assurances that no one would be evicted in time to affect existing voting roles or presumably the usual crushing Democratic majorities in the fall's elections. Confident of his legal position, on May 24th, Rockefeller announced that Wally Harrison had accepted his invitation to take the lead in developing an overall plan for the South Mall. Quote, I had a lot to do with everything Nelson didn't do, was how Harrison subsequently described his contributions to the project. Flying up from Washington one day, Rockefeller took him in his confidence. He drew on the back of an envelope a sketch plan and asked me what I thought of it. Harrison said later, I said I didn't know, but it looked pretty good to me. He would live to regret those words. <laughs> Half a mile long by a quarter mile wide, the vast track spanned a deep ravine christened Rat Creek by early Dutch settlers. In the 19th century, 600,000 yards of gelatinous blue clay had been dumped into the stream bread bed to provide building sites for a growing city. Rat Creek itself was converted into a sewer, emptying into the nearby Hudson River. It was Rockefeller's idea, quote, because he wanted the feeling of separation, to bridge the creek with a great wall, in fact, a multi-layered platform. He had seen just such an arrangement in the Tibetan capital of Lhasa on his first honeymoon. <laughs> Thus did the soaring palace of the Dalai Lama lend inspiration for the new Albany. <laughs> Atop this structure with its six floors of parking, mechanical systems, and a 2,500 seat convention center tucked away for good measure, Rockefeller envisioned a quintet of marble-clad office buildings, one taller than the rest, a uniquely shaped ovoid performing arts center, a pair of reflecting pools, each the size of a football field, and a 336-foot-tall arch of freedom to contain within its base draft copies in the president's hand of Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and Washington's Farewell Address. On June 30th, 1962, an appeals court reversed the injunction earlier granted to the city. Rockefeller celebrated by ordering the demolition of 66 abandoned buildings. Mayor Corning vowed to fight on, but soon changed his mind. His suit had been brought, the mayor explained, to gain time for the city, quote, to find out just what this mall meant. <laughs> 
While reiterating his warning of a $600,000 loss in tax revenues, Corning nevertheless praised the governor for his sympathetic understanding. His Damascene conversion was complete. What happened next has long been enshrouded in Albany legend. According to Samuel Bleeker, who studied the matter exhaustively for his Rockefeller book, The Politics of Architecture, Corning telephoned bond lawyer Joseph McGovern, a trusted friend, and described a stalemate in which the heart of Albany was hollowed out, yet Rockefeller was unable to secure a bond issue to pay for Brasilia. <laughs> Joe, Corning concluded, is there any way the city or county can do it for them? There was, just as Erastus Corning knew all along. The state would turn the property over to the city, later Albany County, before leasing it back. Albany County would in turn finance construction of the South Mall by selling a series of 40-year bonds, their proceeds to be funneled back to the state as the county's agent. When the outstanding loan was paid off in 2004, the completed mall would revert to state ownership. Corning's initial explanation of his scheme elicited no response from the governor. A month later, Corning repeated his performance. Oh, is that what you meant, said Rockefeller. Corning, quick to assume credit for cutting the fiscal Gordian knot, claimed that Rockefeller, quote, went after the scheme like a trout for a fly. On April 16, 1963, the legislature overwhelmingly approved the deal with Albany County. Casual estimates pegged the cost of the South Mall at $250 million. Much depended on when ground was broken. Although negotiations with property owners proceeded more smoothly than expected, less than 1% of transactions ended up in court. The same talks dragged on for 18 months. Corning's stall tactics, interspersed with public charges of misrepresentation and bad faith, would delay major construction until 1968, when, a generation later, he was asked on his deathbed to identify his greatest satisfaction in a political career spanning almost 50 years. Corning replied unhesitatingly, I had Nelson by the balls. <laughs> this missed a larger point. For while Corning indulged an ancient grudge, his city had been permanently remade by the adversary whose signed photo the dying mayor hung over his commode. <laughs> there is little doubt which man had the last laugh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, would be, I would be remiss if I did not publicly acknowledge with profound gratitude, as any student of Albany history uh, would, uh, Bill Kennedy and Paul Grondahl, whose books I plundered liberally uh, for this. Questions? Did Questions? We a, did we set up a mic? Are we going to set up a mic? Questions, comments, constructive criticisms will be entertained. Uh, I just started your book, and I was intrigued by the fact that you began the book at the 64 convention. I'm out here. And um, to the... Okay. All right. <laughs> and I thought that was a very interesting way to start the book, because it was really, it seemed to me, his low point in life. And I think then, it's yeah. his high point. And then, then you made it his high point. Exactly. Did oh. you, was that your intention? I mean, the, I, look, I, I, I think it's a defining moment. There is a generation, there are a lot of people who don't know who Nelson Rockefeller was. There are a lot of people who don't understand what a polarizing, defining figure he was. And I think there's no moment better to illustrate all of that or to introduce him. He was a competitive guy. I remember Jim Cannon said, you know, if he'd been born on the Lower East Side, he would have been uh, the feistiest bo you know, boxer in the, uh, in the neighborhood. Um, 
It introduces Rockefeller as well as a man of principle, a man of conviction, someone whose kind of republicanism died that night. There are very few moments in history that you can see literally the page being turned. Um, the Republican Party the next morning, on, after what New York, the New York Times referred to as Bastille Day in reverse, July 14th, 1964, when Nelson Rockefeller, after midnight, tried in the face of catcalls from hundreds and hundreds of, of ascendant Goldwaterites, well aware that it was now their party, no longer his. They tried to boot him off the stage. And what, of course, did was to illustrate for the national television audience the very extremism that Rockefeller was there to decry. That's a subject that seems to be evergreen. Um, indeed, highly contemporary, I would argue. But in any event, um, that's one way of making him contemporary. It's a way of placing him in his time and milieu. And I think with many people, you know, he got more mail after that than at any time in his career, um, people who thought it was his finest hour, standing up to the bullies and um, I was, well, I was uh, 10 years old, and uh, my parents let me stay up that night. And none of us expected to see what we saw. That was the first real television convention. And Americans in 1964, even though we'd been through the assassination of a president, we were not prepared. We were a more mannerly country. Um, we were not prepared to see what we saw in the Cow Palace that night. And it was him. Someone else could have gotten up and said the same thing and there wouldn't have been a reaction. They hated Nelson Rockefeller and they hated what he represented. They felt that the Eastern establishment and New York in particular, I mean, they spat out the words, you know, like a curse word, New York. Uh, they felt that New York had robbed them over and over again of their party that it had nominated people like Dewey and Wilkie, and yes, Eisenhower and Nixon. So finally, you remember my story about Goldwater in 60, finally they were in control of their own party and they didn't like being lectured to by the man who had, in their view, not only lost the nomination, but had very little claim to moral authority. came on New York State right. when he uh, took office, and then the tax burden when he left. Could you talk about that? And, Absolutely. And the sales it, tax was a, was a huge thing. Absolutely. Um, thing. It's, a, it's a fascinating, well, I, I put it in the context of the 66 race, where, um, in fact, it was, in, in a sense, a referendum on the taxes up until that point. And again, in 1970, to be sure, he was helped by the habit the Democrats had of nominating hopeless candidates. But people didn't think they were hopeless at the beginning. I mean, Arthur Goldberg was a very impressive man on paper. Um, it was just when he started campaigning that things reversed. That said, um, it's a fascinating thing. The danger of using phrases like Rockefeller Republican is, is it's monolithic. R Nelson Rockefeller wasn't a Rockefeller Republican by the 1970s. You're absolutely right that pay as you go, which was, let me back up. In his first year, tell, the very definition of the word fiscal responsibility changed. In 1959, he comes into office. There's a gap, budget gap left by Avril Harriman. They go through the budget. They, they, they genuinely cut substantially, and it's still not enough. And he doesn't want to spend four years nickel and diving uh, like Harriman. He wants to be the unharriman. And so he introduces a tax package, passes it, and Business Week declares him the Wunderkind of American politics and praises his fiscal responsibility. Because in that context, at that time, fiscal responsibility 
on Wall Street meant closing a budget gap. Now, you're absolutely right. Over the years, fiscal responsibility uh, and Nelson Rockefeller uh, parted ways. Um, <laughs> and yet, the electorate had, again, any number of opportunities to, to pass judgment. Um, here's when I think there was a turning point. 1964, as the first five years of the Rockefeller governorship, really pay as you go meant what it said. Um, and the reason was because Nelson had to think occasionally about Republican convention delegates. And it wasn't legislators at Albany so much, but he had to think about Wyoming cowboys and Alabama, you know, former Democrats, but people who were far more conservative, who were profoundly suspicious of Easterners and, and frankly, of Nelson Rockefeller. Um, human rights was declaring in his first year that uh, the party would uh, commit intellectual suicide if it were to nominate such a free spending, high taxing character as Nelson Rockefeller. The Conservative Party of New York uh, was created in many ways uh, to drive Nelson Rockefeller uh, from public life. And um, the interesting thing is, more often than not, people ask me about his move to the right. Um, it was cultural, not fiscal. People who think that Rockefeller became somehow conservative in his later years need only look at the big priority that he pushed as vice president something called the Energy Independence Corporation, which was a $100 billion federal program um, based on bonding. Sound familiar? And, and particularly the moral obligation bond. So I think the, the, there's no doubt, for the left, he is criticized for the drug laws at Attica. The right, quite understandably, um, questions his fiscal management. Um, and then, of course, it was topped by the bankruptcy of New York City, and even before that, of the, of the, um, of the UDC, the Urban Development Corporation, which was his response, characteristically outside-the-box response, to the fact that New York voters were reluctant, time after time, to approve housing referenda. Um, racial connotations were read into that. I think that's not altogether unrealistic. Um, on the day that Dr. King was buried at a funeral organized and paid for by Rockefeller's agents, the legislature was to vote on the Urban Development Corporation, arguably the single most radical piece of legislation of its kind in the history of the United States, because what it did was gave the state of New York the power to override local zoning ordinances. Um, Nelson went to Albany, uh, went to Atlanta, reassured that the legislature pro forma would pass the UDC as a tribute to Dr. King, and uh, he found out that he'd been double-crossed, he thought, by Speaker Duryea. Um, and he let them know from his plane that he, they, they had better pass the UDC that night or there would be no more favors for anyone as long as he was governor meaning no more bills, no more bridges, no more anything. And what followed was a remarkable, raw display of gubernatorial power, unseen since Tom Dewey sent the state police into movie theaters, restaurants, private homes, and establishments of less repute to drag legislators out uh, to uh, change their minds and vote as he wanted them to. Um, and in fact, the legislature reversed itself in the course of that evening, and the UDC was uh, adopted. It didn't last very long. Uh, 
By 1973, there was a proposal to build mixed housing in Westchester County. And guess what? There was a legislative re revolution. The governor was told, you can have the UDC, but you have to give up the, uh, the power to, over local zoning. At that point, his power was already on the wane, arguably, and um, so be it. And then, of course, the UDC was the, the agency symbolically under Ed Wogue, overbuilding, overpromising, underfunding, that went technically bankrupt um, before anyone else. And um, it's part of the record. But you have to keep in mind Nelson Rockefeller in 1961, 62, 63 was not the same governor or the same spender or the same budgeter. One quick story. To illustrate how things changed. When he became governor, uh, the commuter railroads were already having all sorts of problems. Um, just the nature, I mean, there are more and more people in cars. Um, people were less inclined to, to, to travel on these lines. Um, Nelson Rockefeller, at that point, coming into gov government, was a fairly conventional pro-business, certainly believed that you needed a strong, healthy, robust private sector to fund your good intentions. Um, he didn't want to run a railroad. And so his response was to go to the legislature and get tax relief to the local communities so they could deal with the problem. And then at the same time, to provide new air-conditioned cars in the hope that that would be an incentive uh, that would lure people back on the rails. It helped a little, but it wasn't enough. And so by the early 60s, um, the Long Island Railroad was threatened with bankruptcy. He did the calculations. If the Long Island Railroad went bankrupt, X number of commuters would take to the roads. X number of roads would have to be widened or built. In any event, he decided to take over the Long Island Railroad. And he promised to make it the best in the world, really by election day. Uh, no one thinks he succeeded, but they gave him points for audacity. joy killer um, because there will have to be a book signing and time has gone on. So you get to be the last question. How would you evalu evaluate Governor Rockefeller's relationship with the news media, both at the state and the national levels throughout his political career? Reporters liked him. They liked him. Um, but it also evolved over time. There's no doubt over time as the presidency receded, he became a different man. Um, he became less outgoing. He became more secretive. I think he became more less trusting. Um, in 1958, 59, it was all not a game, but it was the joy of discovering things, of learning things. I mean, he had more fun campaigning in upstate New York, where he'd never been, than at any time <laughs> since he joined the New Deal. You know, he went on the subway. I mean, <laughs> He didn't travel on subway as a rule. Um, and of course, the great, the great journalistic invention was the Blintz tour. You know, October 1, 1958, Louis Lefkowitz brings him down to the Lower East Side to humanize him. And he discovered people didn't know this at the time. There, were, there was no guarantee that Nelson Rockefeller would turn out to be a natural campaigner. But he did. He liked people. He, he like his mother, he, you know, he had this great curiosity about people. He cared about people. And it came through. And Avril Harriman, who was a fine gentleman um, with a somewhat ducal manner, um, was just outclassed. But anyway, so Nelson goes down to the Lower East Side, trailed by photographers and reporters for this surreal experience this encounter of cultures. Um, 
And there was, a, there was a wonderful, you know, the, he went up and tried to shake hands with an elderly gentleman who, you know, who, uh, who withheld his hand. He said, ah, can I put a handshake in a bank? Um, you know, it, it was just, a, it, was, it was just a bizarre series of encounters, but overwhelmingly, uh, you know, people found they, they liked each other. And, um, and it became a legend. But the 58 campaign was not about blintzes. It's interesting, everywhere he went, the Times and other papers said, he was trying something different, he's trying a campaign of ideas. And he went all over the state, left to his own devices, I don't think he would have gone and eaten blintzes. Thank God for Louis Lefkowitz. <laughs> um, he would have made thoughtful, substantive, statistic-laden speeches. You know, he wasn't a very good speaker. He was wonderful off the cuff. But the dyslexia, of course, caused a problem. There's a story, um, he would go to New Paltz and, and say how glad he was to be a New Platz. <laughs> and, and, but because nobody knew that he had dyslexia, people sort of wrote it off. The, the classic example is he, came, he wanted health insurance, universal health insurance at the state level. And um, he'd come up with this program, and he was illustrating this program. And he said, now, say you're, you know, you're a typical family of four, and you earn $100,000 a year. <laughs> well, everyone said, I mean, <laughs> and he didn't understand why they were all laughing at him. <laughs> um, the only time, and of course, it said $10,000 on the text. But, you know, the only time the laugh meter rang louder was when he was trying to explain. He said, imagine that, you know, your family or mine suddenly found ourselves without any money. <laughs> <laughs> then he understood why they were laughing at him. Listen, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>